We are living through one of the most consequential years of our lives. After a summer of protests against social injustice and systemic racism, Mayor Jenny Durkin and the Seattle City Council are days away from finalizing the 2021 budget. We can be an anti-racist city, an anti-racist institution. How will calls to reimagine policing impact our community? And will the city's plan to address the growing homelessness crisis work? We need to repeal this tax immediately. The business community is sounding the alarm on how a new high earners tax will backfire during the pandemic. How do you create an equitable process? Our community panel weighs in. The NAV team was a failed and expensive experiment. Police are often the number one purveyors of violence. Forecasting the city's future priorities, next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. The Seattle City Council is set to approve the 2021 budget with new investments in COVID relief, public safety, supports for communities of color, and more. But it's been a battle to get to this point. A series of vetoes from the mayor earlier this year had raised concerns that continuing political power struggles could impact the city's spending plan. But it appears the latest budget has approval from the council and mayor. So now it's time to convince the rest of Seattle that this $6.5 billion plan will be money well spent. There's plenty to take in with the Seattle City Council's 2021 budget, a new approach to public safety, investments in communities of color, changes in homelessness outreach, and much more. But there's one thing you won't see in this budget process, strong disagreement from Mayor Jenny Durkin. I think that the city council and I are actually very closely aligned. That's a big change from the council's earlier efforts to rebalance the 2020 budget in response to the COVID pandemic, which drew a series of mayoral vetoes that the council voted to override in September. No one benefits from this ongoing back and forth, the repeated vetoes of council priorities. Council budget chair Teresa Mosqueda says the council and mayor came to an important agreement on investing in underserved people, especially communities of color. The mayor's budget called for $100 million for BIPOC communities, but slashed a $30 million equitable development plan funded by the sale of the Mercer Megablock. The council's response, aided by a new higher tax revenue forecast, would restore the Megablock money, cut the mayor's BIPOC plan to $30 million, and put another $30 million into a community-led participatory budgeting process. My hope is that folks see these um, investments as a level amount in both areas and that the, re the recommendations that come forward will be deployed to community members who ultimately need those dollars. The Seattle Police Department's budget will face some cuts next year, though not the 50% the council had supported a few months ago. The final number is about 20% very close to what the mayor proposed, and with more funding shifted towards crime prevention, restorative justice, and diversion. So we are intentionally scaling up investments as we scale down where I think that there's been overinvestment in our current police system. We're just posting a sign on your tent. We're gonna Regarding homelessness, the council has disbanded the navigation team for a non-police-led outreach model and is hoping to provide more assistance to Seattleites in need with revenue from the Jumpstart Big Business Tax set to take effect in 2021. We're helping folks pay rent, be able to access childcare, be able to put food on the table. But the business community is offering a word of warning. Our city doesn't get fully healthy again until our downtown gets back on its feet. John Scholes, head of the Downtown Seattle Association, says the council's budget plan generally aligns with the DSA's priorities but he's calling for the repeal of the Jumpstart tax, what he sees as a detriment to businesses large and small. A new tax on payroll in Seattle that will affect more than 700 uh, companies will be a roadblock to recovery. And after months of protest, the DSA is also hoping for a calmer approach to the SPD budget, one that balances calls for racial justice and the need for community safety. This public policy has been decided over Twitter 
and um, and the airwaves, I think we need to be thoughtful, sit at the table, everybody's perspective needs to be heard. And, and that's how we'll make a difference on these two critical issues. On homelessness, Scholes says disbanding the navigation team is a step in the wrong direction. And the DSA believes more public spaces have to be turned into shelters as winter approaches. And we've really sort of said the best we can do right now is a park or an alley or a sidewalk. We must do much more by creating more safe and healthy spaces for people to be and getting more creative. Creativity will be the name of the game as Seattle city leaders continue to wrestle with the COVID pandemic on top of all the city's other challenges with a new budget plan for 2021. Today's meeting is adjourned. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much. And we're going to engage in a discussion here about the city's budget with three community members. Joining us is Angelica Chasaro. She is with Decriminalize Seattle, a leader in the Solidarity Budget Coalition. We also have with us Allison Isinger. She is executive director of the Seattle King County Coalition on Homelessness. And finally, Sean Glaze, research director for King County Equity Now. Angelica, I'm going to start with you. And before we dive into the details, what's your general take of the Seattle City Council's budget for 2021? What impact is this going to have on Seattle? Uh, thanks for that question, Brian. So this is the first year that we're seeing the Seattle Police Department's budget shrink. And so that's relevant to the whole budget because up to this year, almost a quarter of the city's general fund, which is really what's in discussion during these budget uh, cycles, uh, has gone towards uh, the Seattle Police Department and police pensions. And so what's most notable to me is that council is taking a step back, really taking a look at how are we investing all of our city's resources and starting to shift some of that money away from policing and towards other basic needs. And so that's the thing that stands out most for me in this budget. Great, and we're gonna dive into both of those pieces there. So Allison, I'll go to you next and a, a general question again to start here. This is a budget created during a time of crisis that our community has not seen in a hundred years. Is the city responding to that crisis in the right way with its current budget plan? What do you think? Um, I think that our city is in a better position than many communities in part because our uh, city council passed something called Jumpstart Seattle, which is a progressive revenue source that is going to bring in um, uh, over $100 million this year for some emergency COVID relief on top of federal and state COVID relief dollars. So both the mayor in her proposed budget and the city council in their budget proposal thus far have relied on Jumpstart Seattle revenue in part to ensure that our city is responding to the crisis. But of course, the, um, the urgent need for massive federal resources to prevent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people from being made homeless because of the pandemic and the economic crisis associated with it remains. Um, so the city council, I think under the leadership of council member Gonzalez and council budget chair Mosqueda are doing the most they can with um, additional resources and the need is enormous. We have a triple pandemic underway. Right, right. A lot of emer emergencies happening at once in our city. Uh, Sean, your thoughts. Does this budget answer the calls to action that King County Equity Now has been pushing for? Your thoughts. I think what's important to keep in mind is that we have been fighting for a long time for a budget that actually creates true community safety, health and thriving, especially for people who've been locked out of that. And in many cases, people who've been locked out of true community safety, health and thriving are black folks. And so at King County Equity Now, what we wanna see um, is a budget that reflects the fact that those closest to the issues are closest to the solutions. And so I think we're starting to see some of that uh, be reflected in um, decisions that were actually made at the last budget round, you know, this summer, the rebalancing package, where we see millions of dollars um, going into focusing on uh, letting black leadership, black expertise and experience lead the way. Um, what I'm looking for in this budget cycle is a budget that continues to do that, that honors the demands of the, of the movement, as well as uh, the demands that have been put forth, not just five months ago when all of this kicked off, but just for the last few decades and generations of people advocating for smaller police, advocating for more investments and in what keep us safe, healthy, and thriving. 
Okay. Thank you very much for that. Angelica, back to you. I want to talk about the community investment part of this budget. So just the scorecard here for everybody at home. We started with $100 million planned for the mayor's BIPOC proposal. The council cut that to $30 million. Plus the council has also put $30 million into its own participatory budgeting process. I'm trying to talk about these two plans. They seem to have the same goal here, and I'm trying to figure out if the Solidarity Budget Group is interested in helping merge the two or, or what's next here. Thanks, Ryan. That, that's a great question. And I think what's important to do is to think about this $100 million as a uh, uh, a pot of money that actually had already been promised uh, previously to other uh, initiatives. Uh, and so when the mayor sent the $100 million budget over or the $100 million, you know, investment over to council, um, you know, sh she was basically uh, pulling from funds that, for example, there was $30 million already uh, uh, assigned for the equitable development initiative, um, you know, for for housing um, th through the sale of the murder, the Mercer mega block. And so already there was some question about whether that hundred million dollars was real. Um, and so what I'm seeing council doing is basically saying uh, for the $30 million, it's going to participatory budgeting from community. 12 million is that of that is coming from uh, cuts to policing and 18 million that is coming from other sources. And then the, the council is choosing to also give $30 million uh, to the mayor's task force. Um, and I'm gonna actually hand this over to Sean uh, who is really involved in the, in the research that is going to be building up towards participatory budgeting. Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, Sean, if you want to jump in here, that'd be great. Uh, uh, please do. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So the research that we're doing as part of the Black Brilliance Research Project, which is over 100 community researchers, again, built around the idea that those closest to the issues are closest to the solutions. Um, everything from very young people to very old people to everyone in between, multilingual, various lived experiences, some with incarceration or advocacy, you know, just a very robust group of people coming together to really interrogate what creates true community safety, health and thriving, um, you know, coming together that that research project is designing out the priorities for the participatory budgeting process, also designing out um, quite a bit of the process of what that's going to look like. So when we think about the investment pieces, we think about how do you create an equitable process? Well, you do that by listening to those people who've been most harmed and allowing them to really take the driver's seat in some ways, um, you know, being able to leverage that lived experience, that research, that expertise um, into it. So that's important. I do want to add on that um, the way that a lot of us and the black community understand the 100 million that the mayor promised is that the mayor initially promised 100 million to black people specifically, not to right. BIPOC community, and then has just been kind of changing her story over time. Initially, the the once the mayor realized that we um, had one participatory budgeting that people were excited at the idea of being able to have normal everyday folks determine what public money investments look like. Then she created her task force, right, to be able to uh, kind of be alongside the community process that was hard won. Mm -hmm. So I think when I think about community investments right now and the sea of change about what the 2021 budget is, it's unprecedented divestment. And it's also unprecedented and new ways of reinvesting in community where community really gets to take the driver's seat. Yeah, and I'm gonna talk more about participatory budgeting in just a little bit, but Allison, I wanna bring you in here because I think a lot of these issues about communities of color have intersections uh, with homelessness and the work that you do. I know the most recent data in our area shows Native American, Alaska Native people, black people, Latinx people, they make up about 18% of our overall population, all those people together, but they make up more than half the people experiencing homelessness. I'm just trying to figure out if the city is focusing enough on people of color when it comes to spending on homelessness in the budget. What do you think? When it comes to homelessness, you are absolutely right. The inequities and the disparities are grotesque. They are shocking. And the, the need to redress past inequities and the fact that our community and our entire nation have essentially created a massive crisis of homelessness and have a lot of ground to cover to make that up, um, suggests that you know one year's budget cycle is not going to um, 
make all corrections. There are additional specific investments, particularly for Native American, um, Alaska Native and Indigenous people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Um, Council Member Juarez has specifically sponsored uh, various elements of the budget proposal, and she has gotten, I think, great support from many of her council colleagues for those additional investments. Um, but I think what we know, of course, is that uh, the, the, this is going to take a number of years to redress. There are a number of good local on the ground organizations led by indigenous and black community members who are working in the area of housing, affordable housing and homelessness and human services broadly, but a relatively small number of them. And uh, the, the funding for crises really does not ever match what the need is. So yeah. I think what we're seeing is a desire to see, for example, among the new outreach, community outreach positions being funded to work with people experiencing homelessness in neighborhoods across Seattle. There's specific language in budget proposals to ensure that the workers who are hired reflect the communities of people experiencing homelessness. Right. That's one way to begin to implement within the allocation of funds a different approach and to really shift who yeah. is doing the work and how the work is playing out in our community. Very important part. Uh, Sean, I need to switch gears if I could. I want to ask you a police budget question and start off with you here. Sure. The council did not cut the SPD budget 50%, which I know you would call for a number of different groups called for a majority of council members that supported this just a few months ago. Is it disappointing to you to see this 18% cut that we're seeing coming out of the budget or how do you look at that? Hmm. I think that, well, a couple of things. One, uh, the budget's not done yet. So I'm gonna put that out there. Uh, our demand remains 50%. Uh, we do see 18%. We've also heard 20% thrown out. Um, we've also heard that in order for form C's, this particular part of the budget process um, to be you know, completed and to move forward, you have to identify um, cuts before you can make investments. And so mm -hmm. we still see a lot of uh, potential for cuts in the Seattle Police Department budget. Everything from the hiring freeze, uh, which we, we can call it a hiring freeze, but just cutting the money to be able to hire uh, more police officers would get us another nine to 10 million. Um, there's still opportunities to make just deeper cuts, um, honestly. And I'll pass it to Angelica because she and I have been talking about this quite a bit about yeah. some specific areas where we see some opportunities to make more cuts. S sounds good to me. And Angelica, I want to make sure I do draw you in here and just bring up this idea of defunding the police. It's a controversial, controversial term around the country. I know in Minneapolis, uh, for example, city leaders there basically dismantled the police department a few months ago. A number of officers quit. Crime's gone up. We've recently had a large number of officers quit in our city, too. Homicide rates, the highest we've had in years. I know you've heard that from the SPD. I guess this whole idea of continuing the call to cut the budget by half, do you want to keep doing that? Where does the pressure need to go here? What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, and thank you for bringing up the example of Minneapolis. We're actually in touch with um, uh, people who are pushing the same demands over there. And and actually, there the, the police department has, has not been dismantled. There, there are ongoing conversations. <coughs> But actually, the city council is proposing a similar thing that ours is proposing, which is actually to increase hiring this coming year for police officers. And so, you know, as Sean was saying, what we're really thinking about is, yes, it, this city is, is one where people face harm, where people face violence. And we also have to come to grips with the fact that police do not, in fact, stop killings. They show up after the fact. Police do not um, uh, keep us safe. And so and in fact, for black community members, it's the opposite. Police are often the number one purveyors of violence. Um, and so this is where we're thinking this is a time for us to think about what is the role that police are playing in Seattle. And we believe that we could cut at least half of the police department in this budget cycle and immediately reinvest those dollars into things that would actually keep people safe. Um, as Sean was saying, we're definitely not there with this budget. What we're seeing is, and the council members will talk about the fact that they are actually eliminating, uh, um, I think almost funding for 150 positions. What's not as clearly known is that actually those 150 positions were, are vacant positions. And so the Seattle City uh, Council and the mayor have in the past 
funded police budgets way over the amount of uh, workers who actually were employed and, mm -hmm. and on the streets. And that is not the case for any other city department. No other city department has 150 vacant positions that they just get to keep the funding for. And so we're happy to see that funding for vacant positions pulled, but at the yeah. same time, council as of now, and again, this is not finished and, and this is why you know we'll be pushing until the vote next week, mm -hmm. uh, is actually planning to have $9 million in the budget that would in fact allow for hiring 114 officers um, which is uh, given the number of officers they expect to leave next year, 24, 25 more than they currently have. And so right. even as they're cutting money, um, as they're doing some transfers, they're actually still planning to grow the force by at least 25 officers by accepting the mayor's projections in their budget. And so that this is definitely does not go far enough. We think it's really time to shift to a new strategy where that yeah. $9 million would go immediately to scaling up 911 civilian alternatives, um, mm. because we actually believe that would, you know, we are concerned about community safety and want sure. to see that actually happen. Okay, thank you. Allison, another big change for the SPD budget. We don't have a navigation team, a police-led group doing homelessness outreach. I've been talking to a few people about this. The Downtown Seattle Association tells me this is a step in the wrong direction. We're going to see more people sleeping on parks and, and sidewalks and whatever else. What do you think the impact of cutting the NAV team will be? And what does the future of homelessness outreach look like in Seattle at this point in terms of what the budget uh, proposals are right now? Well, Brian, if the navigation team had done anything to prevent people from being homeless and without shelter, then over the last five years, you would have seen enormous success stories coming out of that um, very small, very expensive $8.1 million effort, which involved for most of its existence, only two actual outreach and engagement staff. It is quite clear that that is not what the NAV team was designed to do, nor is it what the NAV team did. And when I say that, I'm not saying that there was nothing positive in their interactions. What I'm saying is um, when people are experiencing homelessness, what they need is they need safety, shelter, stability, and um, the, the opportunity to engage with someone who is actually trying to get them to a better alternative place. Um, the NAV team was a failed and expensive experiment that lasted through multiple administrations. And I would hope that uh, we have better use for $8 million and for those um, employees to turn their attention to other more actually productive ways of engaging both with the community groups that are doing the on the ground outreach work every day and every night in this city um, and with the residents and business owners who are in neighborhoods where some of the thousands of Seattle residents who don't even have shelter are living. And yeah. so our proposal to um, eliminate that particular use for $8.1 million of city funding was a proposal to really shift the approach to reinvest more deeply in what we know works and is effective. One of the things that I think it's really helpful uh, to remind folks of is, especially now with the cold, wet, windy, mm -hmm. extreme weather, there are something like six or 7,000 people in King County who are outside because our shelters are full. We've lost around 400 uh, beds of shelter capacity in our community since COVID-19 began. And that's um, because of the need to shift shelter models to um, situations in which people, both guests and staff can be safer given the nature of this very contagious and deadly virus. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing more people of course being made homeless because of the economic crisis that is affecting especially yeah. low income people people with disabilities black mm -hmm. indigenous and other people of color yeah. so um you know what i think is really exciting about the conversations that we are able to have in this community again that we will be having for many years to come mm -hmm. is let's talk about re what really works the mental strain that exists yeah. because of the COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. on those of us who are fortunate enough to have a safe place to sleep every night mm -hmm. and a door that locks is real. And yeah. it's probably going to get worse over the course of this winter. Okay. Imagine okay. what that would be like if you didn't have that safety and security. 
That's yeah. what we need to answer. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I need to wrap up with our final piece here, if we could. Uh, just some uh, final words of advice, I guess, for our city council as they put the finishing touches on the 2021 budget. Uh, Sean, maybe I can start with you here. I know participatory budgeting is a big deal. Where does that money go? Who gets to decide where it goes, et cetera? Some final thoughts from you, please. I can give you about uh, 30 seconds, please. Sure. Well, the way that it's currently designed and the way that it's currently being implemented is an equity focused uh, participatory budgeting process that is really taking to heart those closest to the issues or closest to the solutions. And here with the Black Brilliance Research, that means that people with that brilliance, expertise, leadership, uh, get to help design that process, decide the priorities um, that will be focused on for the PB process, decide the mechanism uh, that the steering committee will be decided, all of those really important integral pieces, um, those will be decided by those closest to the solutions. And so that's what we are excited to see. And that's um, the process that council has supported. And that's what community is advocating for. And I know we're going to see a lot more of that over the next several years. So thank you for that input there. Uh, maybe, Allison, I can go to you here. Final words of advice for the council as they finish up the budget here. 30 seconds, please. Sure. Um, I mean, I think the city council should continue to be bold and be brave and be responsive to what many in the community are agreed upon. Mm -hmm. um, I think we are not actually interested in governance via slogan. We're interested in council being responsive and responsible and shifting investments into the long underfunded kinds of projects and interventions and programs that work, that have really great hope and promise for people to see results even in the midst of a pandemic of racism um, and of uh, the crisis of homelessness, which is mm -hmm. very likely about to become much worse. Got it. Thank you. Angelica, I can give you the last word. 30 seconds, please. Sure. I mean, I think I would tell city council, this is just a tremendous opportunity you have. Um, you know, so many groups have come together in a way that is really unprecedented, climate justice, racial justice, immigrant rights groups, to really uh, say that our struggle to build a more equitable city is interconnected and that divesting from police goes hand in hand with investing in the Green New Deal, investing in more housing, investing in building sidewalks, investing in black communities. And so just accept that challenge that you've been given. Uh, and we invite you to keep divesting from the things that don't work and investing in our communities. All right, thank you all for your time here. I should point out the council plans to vote on this budget package before Thanksgiving. The mayor expected to sign it in the first week of December. We're gonna keep you updated right here on Seattle Channel and we will be right back. What are people on social media saying about Seattle's budget? One person writes, with hashtag solidarity budget, we're calling for hashtag no new cops. Another person writes, cutting cops will mean more unpoliced crime and the backlash to defunding will grow. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Coming up next time, seeking social equity in the cannabis industry. The city and state are working on helping black people and other minorities gain a foothold in the lucrative pot industry as a way to address past harms and create generational wealth. How would this work? And why is the rain man Sean Kemp getting in the game? Find out next time on City Inside Out. I hope you join us.